The 2023 season is over. Trades can now be made, and starting next week, free agency will open in Major League Baseball. The O's will have a chance to add to their team, but first, let's look back on how they added to the team over the last calendar year. The moves that worked and the moves that didn't, we rank them all. Coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles. Your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Friday, November 3rd, 2023, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb, and coming up on today's episode, we are ranking the Orioles' 12 player acquisitions that may, they made during the last calendar year, from number 12, which didn't work at all, to number one, which played a huge role in the Orioles winning 101 games and winning the AL East in 2023. That's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's 150 bucks just if your team wins. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started today. So here's what we're doing on today's episode. This is the entire premise, basically. World Series ended on Wednesday night. Congratulations to the Rangers, who took down the Diamondbacks in five games to win their first ever World Series title. One day later, on Thursday, the offseason begins. You can trade with teams, and you can negotiate with your own in-house free agents. That period lasts for five days. And then, basically starting Monday of next week, free agency fully opens. Everyone across the board is eligible to be signed. So that means we are very close to the Orioles once again having a chance to try and upgrade their team. Now, the O's in the last calendar year, in terms of moves they made to help the 2023 team, they made 12 moves altogether, bringing in major league players who... They thought would have some sort of impact or did make some sort of impact for the Orioles. And we're going to rank them 12 to 1 based on how positive or negative that impact was and try to learn some things from how the Orioles operated last offseason to how they could operate this offseason and at the next trade deadline as well. So let's start with number 12, the last one on this list. Barely made the list, but because this guy was supposed to have a bigger impact and did pitch a little in the big leagues. Number 12 is signing Michael Givens to a one-year, $4 million deal last offseason. Now, yes, it wasn't a lot of money, but the Orioles brought back Givens, who they had drafted, who they had brought to the big leagues, who was a big part of the Buck Showalter bullpens. They traded him away to the Rockies back in 2020, and then they re-signed him to a one-year deal just to get some, like, veteran kind of insurance in the bullpen. They figured Givens wouldn't be more than a middle reliever this season, but they thought, hey, He's a guy who stayed fairly healthy throughout his career. We had him here for a while. We know what we can get. We know the stuff's a little down, but he can be an insurance policy for our young relievers. He ended up being the exact opposite for the Orioles. Suffered a knee injury in spring training, was on the injured list to start the year, and we didn't see him until May. When we finally saw him, it was not good. He threw, in total, In six games for the Orioles this season, four innings, five runs on four hits, two strikeouts, and six walks in that time. When he was pitching, his fastball averaged 91.6 miles per hour. Last season, for Givens, he was at 93.6, just one year ago. And at his peak with the Orioles, a few years back, he was at 95.6 on average for the fastball, down four miles per hour on fastball velocity. He was not right. He was not healthy. Then he had the shoulder injury. Once he came back from the knee injury, that put him back on the injured list and basically made him out for good. The Orioles released him during the year because they knew he wasn't coming back and they needed the space. And he was done. And it was bad. And yeah, it's nice that they didn't you know spend 10, 15 million on him or give him a multi-year deal. But like, he is cooked. I... I Unless he has some sort of surgery that helps him everywhere, I would think Michael Givens' big league career is done. And you add all that in to the fact that, 
hey, you didn't have Dylan Tate all year, and we still don't really know the status of Dylan Tate's injury because of the elbow and forearm issues. You didn't have your two guys that you thought would be kind of your veterans that you leaned on in the bullpen. And I think that hurt the pen this year with so many young guys either going into a first or a second season in a big league bullpen. They need to do better than Michael Givens, certainly, because they need to bring in a veteran reliever, especially with Bautista out for all of next season. And it needs to be much better than Givens. But when you add all that in with the fact that he's not a good guy either, that was, I mean, that was the worst move, I think, from Mike Elias as GM so far. I, I am going to say that pretty clearly. Like, that was bad. Number 11 on this list, we go to this year's trade deadline. The Orioles send three prospects, Cesar Prieto, the infielder, Drew Rahm, the left-handed pitcher, and Zach Showalter, the 19-year-old righty, to the St. Louis Cardinals for right-hander Jack Flaherty. Now, the move was made just minutes before the trade deadline this season, and while Flaherty wasn't certainly the best starter available on the trade market, we felt the Orioles needed to get a starting pitcher, and at the last minute, at least they did. And now Jack Flaherty was having kind of a down year. He had a 4.43 ERA with the Cardinals, a, a really bad Cardinals team up to that point. But Flaherty had a great track record, right? Back in 2019, one of the best pitchers in baseball, helping lead the Cardinals to the NLCS. He had been really, really good. Now, he was a pending free agent, but he was fairly young, and you felt like, hey, the stuff is still playing somewhat up. You could get something out of Jack Flaherty here, especially if he finds anything close to his previous form. Well, not only did he come to Baltimore and not perform, ERA-wise and performance-wise, he was worse down the stretch with the Orioles than he was in a struggling season with the Cardinals. Now, I get that he had the shoulder injury and he had the multiple injuries that he was coming off of. But with the O's for Jack Flaherty, nine appearances, seven starts down the stretch. In 34 and two-thirds innings, he had a 6.75 ERA. Now, the interesting part was strikeout rate went up, walk rate went down from his time with the Cardinals. So those things got better, which usually leads to more success. But he was also a guy who got some ground balls, and those helped him. They usually do. His ground ball rate went way down. Everything was hit in the air against him. That meant more extra base hits, more homers and a much higher ERA on the board against Jack Flaherty. He was removed from the rotation in September. They tried to use him out of the bullpen. It went okay enough for the Orioles to put him on the postseason roster as a reliever. They used him one time in the playoffs in mop-up duty. Essentially did not help the O's at all down the stretch, being their number one trade deadline addition. I don't really mind... The prospects they gave up, right, Prieto, Rahm, and Showalter, none of those three are top 10 guys for the Orioles. Honestly, my opinions about these guys, I think Rahm at best is like an up-down guy. I know he pitched well when he came back to Baltimore against the Orioles, but otherwise wasn't very good with the Cardinals. I think his ceiling is pretty low. I think Prieto could be an okay big leaguer because of the hit tool, but he's got, I mean, really not a lot of pop at all. And he's modeled his game to be Luis Arise, but to be a Luis Arise type player in the big leagues, you have to have incredibly elite hit tools, contact tools. Prieto's good, he's not Arise. So unless he finds a little more pop, it's going to be tough for him to become an everyday big leaguer. I think the best big leaguer out of the three that they gave up was Zach Showalter. But if a piece that gets a trade that you think is going to help you win over the line is a 19-year-old right-handed pitcher who is in low A ball, you make that deal. Like, Showalter has some stuff, but he's 19 in low A. You never know what he's going to be over the next three or four years before he would finally get to the big leagues. Don't mind the process. Think it was a fair value for Jack Flaherty. Flaherty just didn't do anything at all. He's not. I I wouldn't think he's coming back and being re-signed with the Orioles. Just uh, not a very good deal right there. Number 10 on this list, the Orioles claim Jorge Lopez off waivers from the Miami Marlins on September 2nd, bringing him back to Baltimore after they dealt him to Minnesota at the deadline last year, struggled with the Twins, was traded at the deadline this year to Miami, struggled there too, Miami DFA'd him, and the Orioles brought him in in September just to get a little more bullpen depth from a guy who they knew very, very well, a guy they'd fixed already. Now, Lopez, when he came in, because he came in after September 1st, he was not eligible to be put on the postseason roster. Would have been interesting if he was eligible. 
I tend to think if he was, he probably would have taken that Brian Baker spot in the playoff bullpen if he was eligible. I think he pitched well enough to at least be above Baker in the pecking order, especially because the the Orioles and Brandon Hyde were using him regularly down the stretch. So I think they would have put him in that playoff bullpen. But the fact that he wasn't postseason eligible moves him down this list. He threw 12 innings with the Orioles. He had a 5-2-5 ERA. Now, he did have 14 strikeouts to two walks. That was really, really good. The home run ball hurt him. Four home runs in 12 outings, including the back-to-back homers he gave up in that crucial game against the Rays in the eighth inning was a tie game. Now, of course, the Orioles did come back and win that game miraculously to clinch a playoff berth, but he was better with the O's than he had been previously with the Twins and the Marlins after the trade. But it's just, if you couldn't use him for the playoffs and he had a bad outing in his biggest outing and you only had him for a month, it's tough to move him higher up this list. Number nine on the list is the other deadline addition the Orioles made. Now, they did make this trade two weeks before the deadline, which was nice. You got a little more out of this guy. But the Orioles acquired Shintaro Fujinami, the right-handed reliever from the Oakland Athletics, for left-handed pitcher Easton Lucas. Now, this trade I thought was fine because, I mean, they gave up Easton Lucas, who was a reliever in AAA, who was having a solid season but was going to be Rule 5 eligible. The Orioles weren't going to protect him. And, yeah, he was having a solid year, but wasn't close to being called up to the big league. So if you can give up a AAA reliever for a big league reliever, even if it's a rental, that is a win on the trade right there. And Fuji wasn't really terrible for the Orioles. I think people have this thought of, like, he was horrendous and unusable. 21 of his 30 outings with the O's were scoreless. It's just the other nine were not very good. He threw 29 and two-thirds innings and had a 4.85 ERA with the Orioles. 25% strikeout rate, good. 12% walk rate was bad, and that was the issue, right? He unraveled too many times, walks would snowball, and he was just somewhat unusable. Had some great moments, a couple of huge saves, had some really bad moments too, and the other reason why he's lower on this list, the Orioles chose not to put him on the postseason roster. There are two trade deadline acquisitions, Jack Flaherty, mop-up reliever in the postseason, Fuji not even on the roster. And I think I had argued this before the postseason, that I understood the argument not to put Fuji on the playoff roster, but I would have given him that last playoff roster spot just because the ceiling is so much higher than a lot of Orioles relievers. But I got that, hey, if you put him in a playoff game and all of a sudden he walks two straight hitters and you still can't take him out because of the three batter minimum, you are not in a good place, especially in the postseason. So I understood why they didn't put him on. The stuff is tantalizing, but you can't put him higher because if they don't trust him to be in that postseason bullpen, which didn't exactly have, like, you know, all of the greatest pitchers in the world in it, I don't know if the Orioles are even interested in bringing him back. I mean, if he still wants to be a starter, there's no way the O's bring him back. If he's okay being a reliever, I could see there being a one-year reunion for 2024, but just, it was, again, a fine trade, right? The Orioles didn't give up anything at all. It's just more that you needed a little bit more out of the deadline, and you didn't get that. We got eight more acquisitions to rank here. Going number eight through number five in the next segment. We'll talk about another reliever who came in late season and early on did much, much more, but did not help the team in the playoffs. Talk about a couple of veterans also as well. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by FanDuel. Now the baseball season is over. Texas Rangers winning the World Series, but we've got the NFL to turn to now. And you can score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 just if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there is no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. So we're ranking them 12 to 1 here. The 12 main player acquisitions that Mike Elias and the Orioles front office made over the last calendar year since the end of the 2022 season on to the end of the 2023 season. We are on to number 8 on our list. And number 8 is a move the Orioles made in August, claiming right-handed reliever Jacob Webb off waivers from the Los Angeles Angels. Now, Webb was a guy coming in who had had a good track record, but was having some real struggles with the Angels. The Orioles couldn't believe they got him. They thought a lot of other teams would put a claim in on him, but the Orioles got Jacob Webb. And at the beginning, it was really, really good. 
His first two weeks with the Orioles in that bullpen, when they needed somebody to help him out, eight and two-thirds scoreless innings, two hits, 12 Ks, and two walks. He was awesome. And pretty much you went into September saying, oh, Jacob Webb is a lock, a lock for this postseason bullpen, right? He's been amazing. Then things got a little off track in September. And in the rest of his outings, the final 16 and a third innings, which included two outings in the postseason, Webb allowed 10 runs on 16 hits over 16 and a third innings and allowed a home run in each of the two postseason games that he pitched in, games one and two against the Rangers, including the kind of crushing blow, the grand slam in the third inning of game two. Overall with the O's, a 3-2-7 ERA in 22 innings for Jacob Webb, so it wasn't like a crazy amount, right, of time that he spent. Now, he is arbitration eligible, going to be due about a million dollars. The O's could bring him back and have him through 2024 and beyond if they wanted to. I am right on the fence with what I think they'll do with Jacob Webb, but the reason he's lower on the list is that, yeah, he was really good at the beginning, but again, I need the help in the postseason, and he gave them no help. In the, he actively hurt them when he pitched in the postseason. Number seven on this list was an offseason trade from last year. The Orioles acquiring the left-handed pitcher Cole Irvin and right-handed pitching prospect Kyle Verbitsky in a trade with the Oakland Athletics in which they sent one of their better prospects, infielder Daryl Hernandez, back over to Oakland. Now, I see a lot of people get angry with this trade because they say, oh, Daryl Hernandez was great. Yeah, he was minor league player of the year at one publication for the Athletics made it all the way to AAA by the end of the year, and Oakland had an amazing season. He had a really, really good 2022 in the O system as well, so you could kind of see this trajectory coming. But when you look, and I get, right, you know, you shouldn't just trade prospects to get rid of them, right? You should get some value back. But when you look at the O's infielders, everybody's clamoring. You know, you already got Henderson and, and, and Westberg, these guys in the big leagues, right? But everybody's clamoring for Jackson Holiday as usual, clamoring for Joey Ortiz, clamoring for Connor Norby, right? You've got all these guys who are infielders, who need to get to the big leagues. Daryl Hernandez was behind all of those guys in the Orioles' pecking order. It was going to be really tough to get him to the bigs. The O's were going to trade him no matter what. And I understand that Cole Irvin wasn't great, right? 77 and a third innings, 12 starts, 12 relief outings, had a 4.42 ERA. Started the year off in the rotation, three bad starts, went to AAA for a while. When he came back, he was much better as both a starter and a reliever down the stretch for the Orioles. But it wasn't what you wanted. It wasn't the innings eater the Orioles thought they were getting. A guy who's going to throw you 180 plus innings every year, give you like a four ERA, you know, keep the ball on the ground, not get beat up, and and when he's at his best, like flummox hitters and get through seven, eight, and eight innings of, of one run ball. Now, because he had his struggles, that's why he's not higher on the list. But the reason this trade is not lower is that A, the O's would have never used Hernandez. B, Verbitsky had a pretty good season in high A and double A for the Orioles. And listen, Cole Irvin has three more years of team control. It's not like they made this trade and they just had Irvin for 2023. If that was the case, this might be down right at the bottom of the list. But they still have three more years of team control for Cole Irvin. And I get that if he's not good, they're not going to keep him around for three years, right? It doesn't matter how much team control. But I think he was good enough in the second half this year. I have a little bit of a hot take going into next year. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more throughout the offseason. I think Cole Irvin makes at least 20 starts for the 2024 Baltimore Orioles. And I think he earns that role and is good enough to stay in it. I just think we're going to see Cole Irvin be the pitcher he was for long stretches in Oakland next year for the O's. And the fact that you got a pitcher with four years of team control who had been good, that's always a, a deal you, you want to try and make. And, and again, that's why it's kind of right, right in the middle of this list. Number six on the list, the Orioles signing Adam Frazier last offseason to a one-year $8 million free agent deal. He was Adam Frazier, right? Now, his season was a little different, and you go back a couple of weeks, did the kind of Adam Frazier season review episode with Paul Mancano of the Baltimore Banner. You know, about 450 plate appearances, hit 240, not very Adam Frazier-like, 93 WRC+, plus, right? Close to league average. Really bad defense. Defense took a hop off a cliff, which was weird. Kind of an odd season where his 13 homers were the most of his career, but he had 13 homers through the end of July and then did not homer in August or September. And, and quite frankly, he was not very good at the plate at all in the final two months of the season. That hurt as well. But also on the flip side, Adam Frazier kind of did what the Orioles needed him to do, right? They brought him in 
to take some of the pressure off the young infielders and be in the lineup until the other young infielders were ready. And that's kind of what he did, right? He was much better in the first half of the season. And then once we got to the second half, Jordan Westberg showed he was more so ready to go. Adam Frazier ceded a lot of that playing time to Jordan Westberg, and Frazier also didn't really produce, but that's okay because he didn't produce when the Orioles needed him less. He produced early in the year when they needed him more, so it was just like an okay addition. Again, he won't be back. Number five on this list, another trade from last offseason. The Orioles trade a player to be named later who ended up being a rookie-level prospect that I don't think will ever see the big leagues over to the New York Mets for catcher James McCann. And the Mets are paying 19 of the $24 million remaining on James McCann's two-year contract. He is signed through the end of 2024. So the Orioles basically getting a good backup catcher for two years, $5 million, and a nothing prospect. Thought that was a pretty good deal by the Orioles. And yes, James McCann didn't like light the world on fire. Played 70 games, 77 WRC+, but he was good defensively, seemed to be a good leader on the clubhouse. Basically was the perfect backup catcher for Adley Rutschman, and he will assume that role next year because he is still under contract. And then we will see after 2024, it depends how he performs this season. But I thought that was a perfect cheap deal to get a backup catcher. That's why it's up here at number five. We got the top four to get to coming up next to finish off the pod. We'll talk about a couple more veteran free agents that came in. Actually, really, all four of these are veterans who joined the organization. And I think all made a really big impact on the Orioles winning the division this season. So we are counting down from 12 to 1. Orioles best acquisitions in the last calendar year doing this right before free agency opens up next week and the O's can start making some new and hopefully better acquisitions heading into 2024. But number four on the list, the Orioles signing Kyle Gibson during the winter meetings last year to a one-year $10 million deal. Now, Gibson had some bumps in the road. Do not get me wrong this season. But he made 33 starts for the O's. He tossed 192 innings. He had a 4.73 ERA. The FIP was 4.13. Should have been a little better. He eight innings. He had a lot of quality starts. Yes, he had some blowups, but he had a lot of quality starts. He ate a lot of innings, which the Orioles needed. He was also better than Jordan Lyles, which was good. They did the upgrade there. And he took some of the pressure off of all the Orioles' other young pitchers. And this is something I said during August. I got attacked for it a lot. I think I turned out to be right. Kyle Gibson had pitched well enough. Some of this is because of the state of the Orioles' rotation. But Kyle Gibson had pitched well enough to earn a postseason start. He didn't get it. He pitched well in relief, in long relief, in Game 3 of the ALDS after Dean Kramer got rocked and gave up six runs in that start. But I think he was what the Orioles needed. Do I think they'll bring him back? I don't think so. But for $10 million for an innings eater, they got a guy who certainly ate up 192 innings, showed some really good flashes, had some really good starts and some key moments for the Orioles. I think it was a good signing all in all. Now, should it have been the best they did signing-wise for a pitcher? Absolutely not. That was the failure. But Kyle Gibson himself in a vacuum, he did his job this season. Number three on the list. After Cedric Mullins goes down with a groin injury in late May, the Orioles go out and sign Aaron Hicks to a big league contract and kept him around for the rest of the year. It was initially just to be kind of a short-term fill-in for Mullins after he was, you know, out. They thought maybe, uh, you know, four to six weeks with that groin injury. Let's get Aaron Hicks in here. He's a veteran. He had just been DFA'd and released by the Yankees after another bad start to his season, getting booed in every at-bat in New York. He needed a fresh start. And Aaron Hicks came in, and he was a revelation. He kind of resurrected his baseball career with the Orioles this season. 65 games for the O's, and Hicks had his own injury issues, right? He went for two short stints on the injured list himself as well. Like, he wasn't totally healthy. But when he was out there, 65 games played, 236 plate appearances. Aaron Hicks was one of the best hitters on the Orioles this year when he was playing. Hit 275, 381 on base, 425 slugging. That's a 128 WRC plus, 28% better than league average. 15% walk rate was best on the Orioles. He was really, really good, and his defense was still solid. We know how good his arm is, and he was able to play all three outfield positions, including fill in in center field for Cedric Mullins. And when you think about it, really the Orioles' only, like, really, really good postseason moment in the ALDS when they got swept, the only moment where we were able to kind of explode as a crowd at Camden Yards was Aaron Hicks's two-run single in the first inning of Game 2 that put the Orioles up 2 nothing. That was a huge moment. Also, later in that game, hit a three-run homer to try to bring the O's back a little bit in the ninth inning. Like, he had a good postseason. He had a good regular season. 
And I don't know if the O's will bring him back because they got a lot of outfield options to sort through. And Hicks is just another guy in that mix, and you don't know if he'll kind of regress back to what he was with the Yankees the last couple of years. But he was like the perfect piece to come, and it wasn't just on the field. Again, I've talked about this a lot. The Orioles loved Aaron Hicks. Brandon Hyde loved his veteran leadership. I mean, the young players in that locker room just gravitated towards Aaron Hicks. He seems to be a great, great clubhouse guy, just a great guy in general to have on your team. I know it would be tough to fit him into the roster, but I would love to have Aaron Hicks back on the Orioles, at least for the start of 2024. That's how good he was last season. Number two on this list, the Orioles. A day before opening day, make a trade that seemed like it would be nothing, but it turned out to be a lot. They sent some cash over to the Minnesota Twins for 33-year-old left-handed reliever Danny Coulomb. And Coulomb makes the opening day roster, and we're like, okay, they went and got somebody to be a, a final lefty. He's the last guy on the roster. Uh, okay, like, what? what is this? We were basically like, yeah, maybe he'll eat a couple of innings out of the pen, but really, what is this? He was cast aside by a Twins team that didn't exactly have an amazing bullpen going into the year. Coming off hip surgery. We're like, what's going on with this guy, Danny Coulomb? Well, it turns out the Orioles saw something pretty good there. 51 and a third innings for Coulomb out of the Orioles' bullpen this year. Missed a little bit of time with injury, but otherwise was great. 2.81 ERA, 28% strikeout rate, 6% walk rate, one of the lar- lowest hard hit rates, lowest average exit velocities in all of baseball. Not just on the Orioles, in all of baseball, he induced some of the softest contact in the league. Dude was awesome. Not only that, you get him for just cash, and he's under team control for 2024 as well, so you get Coulomb back fairly cheap for next season too to once again be one of your best lefty relievers. He got lefties out, he got righties out, he pitched in all different spots from getting saves to coming into the fifth. I mean, remember in the playoffs, he was coming in in like the you know third, fourth, fifth innings to keep the O's in games. Like He was doing everything for the Orioles this year. Danny Coulomb was like the glue that held the Orioles' bullpen together this season. He was unbelievable. What a find by the Orioles to go get him this season with the new slider that he worked on last offseason, and he brought it into Baltimore, and it worked. Cannot wait to watch him pitch this year. But I think you know what the number one move is going to be. Last offseason, the Orioles make another trade for cash on a DFA'd first baseman. They were doing it all, right? They were bringing in Franchi Cordero. They were bringing in Lewin Diaz. They were bringing in Josh Lester. They were just... They were seeing, they bringing in Curtis Terry. Remember him from, from spring training? Like, they were just bringing in anybody, right, who could maybe play some first base and, and maybe be an option behind Ryan Mountcastle. And they got this guy, Ryan O'Hearn, for cash from the Kansas City Royals, who had these terrible stats with a bad Royals team for, the, like, the last four years. And then the Orioles themselves DFA'd O'Hearn, got him off the 40-man roster, were able to keep him in the organization and invited him to a big league spring training. But it was like, I don't think this guy's making the roster. Doesn't seem to be in the, in the fold. Then he has a really good spring training. And you're like, oh, okay, but there's no space for him. He does not make the opening day roster. He starts the year in AAA Norfolk. Kind of comes up and down a couple of times. And then in May, all of a sudden, he's just kind of on the O's bench. And he's still there, and he's still there, and he's getting some hits. And you're like, what's going on with this guy O'Hearn? Then he hits that three-run homer in Toronto off Jordan Romano to tie the game in the eighth. And you're like, what's going on with this guy O'Hearn? And then Ryan Mountcastle goes out for multiple months with the vertigo. And O'Hearn's basically in there every day. And all of a sudden... You got a guy who plays 112 games this year, almost 400 plate appearances, hits 289, 332 on base, 480 slugging, 14 homers, 118 WRC+, plays a really good defense at first base when he's out there, could play a little corner outfield when he needed him to, and he's under team control for 2024. You got him for another season. Power hitter, goes the other way, controls the strike zone. What a find he was. And when you especially include the fact that Ryan Mountcastle missed that much time, I don't know where the Orioles would have been without Ryan O'Hearn. And he had so many clutch moments, big hits late in games as well. I just, I cannot imagine where this Orioles, I will say it right now to finish off this episode. I don't think the Orioles win the division this year without Ryan O'Hearn. That's how important he was in big moments and stepping in for Mount Castle for the O's this season. He was fantastic. What a find. Yeah, his future with the Orioles has questions because he's only got one more year under contract. You know, you're worried he might be a one-hit wonder, and there's a lot of good prospects in that spot. There's Ryan Mountcastle already there. There's Heston Kerstad knocking on the door already here. There's Kobe Mayo certainly knocking on the door next year. So there's a lot of questions about Ryan O'Hearn. But if he keeps hitting like he did this year, he's not going to give up that spot. They're going to keep giving him at-bats because that was just an unbelievable turnaround story by him and by the Orioles in 2023. But, of course, moving forward, we would like the O's to 
hey, these great you know pickups off the scrap heap like Coulomb and Hicks and O'Hearn, like they were great signings. They helped the O's win a lot of games. But maybe let's not have to do that as much because the Orioles pick up some 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 real guys, spend some real money, make some real trades on some on some real impact players this offseason. Starting next week, looking at you, John Angelos, looking at you, Michael Elias. Let's start doing that next week. That'd be nice. But that'll do it for the week on the podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for tuning in. We are back Monday. Free agency opens. We got a mailbag to open as well. Send in your mailbag Monday questions. Email us, lockedonorioles at gmail.com. Tweet me at Locked on Orioles on Twitter, or leave your mailbag questions right here in the comment section of the Locked on Orioles YouTube page, and we'll get to them on a Mailbag Monday episode when we return on Monday morning. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked on Orioles podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.